Good morning. Happy to see you. I'm glad you're here on a holiday weekend. Um, it's great to be in the Lord's house today. A few announcements, and please, I'm just going to make note of these. Uh, they're in the bulletin with additional dates, but carry, carry a bulletin home with you. Um, do have a few opportunities, uh, ladies, with Embrace Game Night, uh, men's breakfast upcoming, uh, youth events, uh, fall senior rally. So I know many of you have information on these as well, but uh, please make note of that. We do have homecoming on October 13th, so be planning for that. Uh, the church, as, as typically does, will provide the meats, and we'll be asking folks to bring uh, sides and desserts. So looking forward to that. As I mentioned last week, Rick Farrell is uh, in the Farrell family. are going to be here. Rick is going to be speaking that Sunday. So be glad to have them back. True homecoming for them uh, So as, as we gather together. Um, I will make note the day before homecoming, October 12th, having a men's conference. There are slips of paper as you leave. We can scan a QR code to sign up. We'd love to have all men sign up. Drop those off with your friends. Have them sign up. We'll have to have this place filled uh, with men and uh, young men that day as we uh, come together and, and uh, grow to become more holy men. Uh, Mr. Johnny has a couple announcements for us. Hey, good morning. Uh, you see where it says the cleanup day is October 5th? You know, that's a week before homecoming. We're doing that to accommodate the, uh, the men's conference and things like that. Um, we're going to start at 8 o'clock, so go ahead and put that on your calendar. But at 7 o'clock, I think we're just going to get a grill out here and start grilling some Nahanda sausage and stuff like that. Get a couple loaves of bread and some, and some mustard. Amen? <laughs> so uh, please come join us and uh, bring some tools, uh, especially the, the electric power tools and stuff for doing remote stuff. And um, we continue to clean out the closets. Donna and Donna did a great job yesterday on the music closet. Um, we're staging all the stuff out in the barn. So again, it's still not too late to clean up your closet if you have one and tag stuff. But um, starting in September, um, we're going to go through and start donating stuff to the Triangle East and to the uh, Prison Alliance, I think, is what Donna had mentioned also. Uh, talked to Kelton this past week, and he has a lot of need for his little mobile trailer with a lot of stuff. But um, you still have an opportunity to get into your closet and tag everything and, and clean it up too. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnny. Uh, we do have care this Wednesday night, so a meal at six, and then visiting, prayer, uh, writing cards at six thirty. Uh, for the deacons' uh, election last week. Just want to let everybody know that Mike Syverson, Beeman Owensby, and Stephen Davis were all elected by the church to be deacons as we enter the next church year. Uh, join me as we open in prayer. Lord, we're thankful to be here. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you'll uh, help us to focus our minds on you. And Lord, I know there's many things that uh, we need to think about, Lord, many responsibilities that we have. But Lord, as we are here, Lord, I pray that we'll focus on you. Lord, you are preeminent. Lord, you are the Holy One. Lord, I pray that uh, you will help us to uh, worship you today. Lord, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to open our eyes, to open our hearts and minds as we read and study your word. Lord, I thank you for how you continue to bless us. Lord, how you're constantly with us as individuals and as a church. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, good morning. Welcome to the worship service at KNBC. We invite you to stand and sing along with us. So glad to see you. We're going to sing uh, There's Power in the Blood this morning. It's the first one, so you sing along with us. Amen. Amen. All right, sing this right here. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood. 
done for us. Thank you for his rescue plan for our lives. As the ushers come forward, we'll have Allison give you the special this morning. Hey, good morning again. And uh, for those that are watching us online, on vacation, or uh, maybe not feeling too well, but you decided to turn in, tune into us on Facebook or something, thank you for joining us. If you would bow your heads. Our Lord our God, we just thank you for another beautiful day, Father, to come to your house, to have the freedom to worship, because we know for a fact that that's not the case around the world in many places, Father. We just thank you for the love and the grace that you give to us, for a Lord that has cattle on a thousand hills, in the house of many mansions, Father. It's not about the money. It's about the acknowledgement that everything we have is, is from you and that we give back to you a tithe and an offering uh, to help support the ministries and um, to reach the lost souls out in this community and, and across this nation and, and world, Father. So thank you for that love, Father. Um, as Pastor George goes to preach, Father, just open our hearts and our minds to the possibilities and the opportunities that the Bible presents, Father, and your word that has withstood the, the naysayers for thousands and thousands of years, Father. So thank you for your love. Amen. This mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tide will never change. They haven't seen what you can do. There is power in your name. So much power in your name. Move the
Do we believe, church? You said it, I believe it. You said it, and it is done. You said it, and I believe it. You said it, and it is done. You said it, I believe it. You said it, it is done. Thank you, Allison. Awesome. Awesome message in song. Yes? Bye. <laughs> oh, my. That brings back memories when, the, when my grandson Jake was over here uh, in the daycare. He called me Papa George, and all the kids called me Papa George, and that was my name. I could walk in the door and have a hundred not a hundred, what, seven or eight kids saying, Papa George, Papa George. <laughs> oh, man. That's good stuff. Doesn't get any better than that, folks. Right. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, thank you for that music just now. Thank you, Lord, for a song about believing and faith and trusting in you. And Lord, that you honor your word. Every word you speak is truth. Every promise you give us will be fulfilled or is fulfilled already. Lord, help us to walk in that faith. Help us to realize, Lord, that you love us 
Lord, that you desire for us to overcome in this life. And the only way we can overcome is through the power of your Holy Spirit. We need the filling, the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. You tell us, Father, that Jesus came to preach the gospel and to show us you in essence. As he walked upon this earth, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then Jesus ascended into heaven and and he said that he was going to send us a comforter. He was going to send us a, an encourager, a strength, a person to strengthen us, uh, to, uh, to give us wisdom and understanding, the paraclete, Father. And you sent the Holy Spirit. And Lord, today I think that too often we do not realize the promises, the abilities, the strength, the wisdom that we forfeit because we do not allow the Holy Spirit time to work in our lives. You tell us in the passage today to wait for the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we need to wait on you. There are things, Lord, that we cannot do. <laughs> we don't know how to do. We don't know where to begin. Oh, Lord God, we, we need a pastor in this church. and uh, Lord, we need you to show him to us. We need the Holy Spirit to unveil your will for us. So, Lord God, be glorified, be honored, be exalted today. Send your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, help us to welcome you, to welcome your Holy Spirit, to be filled with your Holy Spirit of you, as you commanded us. And we give you the praise, and we worship you, and we hallow your name. Blessed be the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name. Oh, Lord God, we worship you and praise you. We exalt you. Glorify, glorify your name today in our midst. That everybody that walks out of here today would, be, would realize that we have been in the presence of Almighty God. We give you our praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're looking at Acts chapter 1, 1 through 8 today. You shall receive power to witness. I think uh, we need to understand that uh, God just is just not going to fill us up when we're sitting in our easy chair with the power and the, and, and the, and the Holy Spirit just to sit there and, and watch a football game or, you know, watch whatever. Uh, he, he wants us to be out witnessing, to be testifying, uh, to be letting the joy of the Lord overflow in us so it overflows in other people's lives. And uh, so that's what this sermon is about today. You shall receive power to witness. The book of Acts is, is a story of success, of the church triumphant, even in the midst of much tribulation. They were going through a lot more tribulation than we are today, but they were seeing a lot more, I believe, of the Holy Spirit uh, in, in their day and their time. And uh, it's a story, the book of Acts is a story that begins with a small group of, of unlettered, uh, uncultured disciples with meager resources, very little money, uh, no prestige, no college or seminary degrees, uh, no media exposure. Praise the Lord for that, I guess. Uh, no magnificent buildings or campuses, no air conditioning. <laughs> but they went out against great obstacles. The imperial might of Rome. Uh, they lived in a, a, a time when uh, Greek culture and the Greek intellectual sophistication uh, combated the gospel. Uh, they lived in a world that was entrenched with religious and pagan traditions since the Tower of Babel. All kinds of gods and all kinds of uh, immoral worship going on, taking place. They went out against these obstacles and, and yet they turned the world inside out and upside down. It says it and records it in the scriptures. Thousands, thousands were coming to the Lord in the first days after the day of Pentecost, after the infilling, indwelling, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, they did so much with so little. And today, folks, I hate to say it, we do so little with so much. Because what we got, what we're putting our, our confidence in and emphasis is not the Holy Spirit. It's in our ability to, 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 to buy things, to uh, have programs. It's, it, it, we're the problem. They had a powerful witness. Their lives testified that they had been transformed. There was something different about them. 
They were new creations. People who had known them realized these are different people than I, than I knew before the day of Pentecost. They had fire in their bones. And they were so full of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God that they just couldn't keep it in. They, they had to share it. And I think of Peter when he goes before the Sanhedrin, the ruling authorities, and they tell him not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And Peter, who had denied Jesus three times just prior to that, says, I'm sorry. <laughs> I cannot but help preach the name of Jesus and proclaim his name. You don't know what Jesus has done for me. That should be our testimony this morning, folks. You don't know what Jesus has done for me. People ask you why you're, why you're so excited. I hope it's because you're excited about your faith and your life in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to look today uh, at these people uh, that, that the response to their witness was either love or hate. It seems like people either wanted to do away with them and and, and, and attack them, or, or they, they wanted to follow them, and they loved them. They wanted to hear more. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 1, we're going to be looking at how they were able to do what they did. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them for 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Jesus, after he was resurrected, stayed on the earth for 40 days. We most, most of us know that. He did a lot of uh, signs. He, he did a lot of teaching there. He had many inf infallible proofs. He you know, told Thomas to touch his side and and, and to feel where the wounds were in his hands. Uh, the former account that, that uh, Luke, is, Luke is the writer of that book of Acts, uh, and he's talking about the former account here, uh, is, is, the, is the gospel of Luke, which records all that Jesus did and all that Jesus taught while he was here on this earth. Uh, on the hills of his resurrection and his ascension into heaven, the disciples are now ready to impart on the mission that God has given them to go into the world and make disciples of all people. And it's going to be a difficult task. Uh, they're, they're going to be facing some difficult times, some, some persecution. Many of them are going to die for their faith. And you know, in, in the history of the disciples, many times they had been a disappointment when Jesus was on the earth. He one time gets them together and says, oh ye of little faith. You know, why, why don't you have more faith? Their faith had been tested and they had come up short. Their track record for the disciples was a cause of concern. But let me tell you, folks, Jesus had a plan. Yeah. Jesus has always got a plan. Whatever you're going through today, Jesus has got a plan. Amen. And we just need to yield ourselves to it. Here's the plan in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit and not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. You know, I read this passage and Jesus says, hey, wait for the promise. It's coming. When God promises something, it always comes. And it comes with, with, with the, full, the full authority of, of God and, and, and the full power of God. He says, you're going to be baptized not many days from now with the Holy Spirit. It's like that went whoop right over the top of their head. Next thing they ask is, well, 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 you're getting ready to leave and you told us you're coming back. When are you going to come back? We want to know when you're coming back. Uh, we, we, you know, they're getting the cart before the horse. Jesus has told them to go into the world and make disciples. And they're going to need power to make disciples. They're going to need the Holy Spirit. I'm going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Well, that's great, Jesus. That's fine. You get on, you do whatever. But, but, but we want to know when you're coming back. Folks, they were clueless. And you know, folks, Looking out at some fine, lovely people today. Some of y'all looking clueless. 
For 300 years, if you were a follower of Jesus Christ, you were persecuted in the church for your faith. Many were put to death. The authorities at that time said, oh, you can worship your Jesus, that's okay, as long as you worship all the other religions and you proclaim that all the other religions are legitimate. Well, folks, that's the situation we find ourselves in today. Uh, yeah, you can have your Jesus. Keep him to yourself, kind of. Don't make a big deal of him. Don't bring him into the workplace. Don't bring him into school. Uh, that, that's all fine. And, and just remember, you, you pay homage to our issues, to our gods, to our uh, cultural desires. So in order to prepare them for what they have ahead of them, Jesus left them a good and perfect gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's left it to you and me today. And folks, we need to get real about this because we are living in a time in history when I believe that we're going to be facing persecution. People in the world today are facing persecution. People in today in, in, in Africa and in Asia and Muslim countries are uh, you know, churches are being burned down. People are being killed uh, just, just for the sake of, 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 of naming and professing the Lord Jesus Christ. It's already happening. It just hasn't happened here with that, with that intensity until today. The Holy Spirit is not a luxury. He's not an afterthought. He's not an add-on. Jesus planned this from the beginning to send us this promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a necessity. The Holy Spirit in us, in essence, is Christ in us. Jesus says that we need Christ in us. We need to abide and dwell in the vine. And the Holy Spirit is, is the part of the Trinity that connects us to Jesus and to the Father. That Jesus is the hope of all glory. And folks, that is more than just a phrase. The Holy Spirit in us is, is, is Christ in us. Yeah. Christ in us says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you no matter what you're going through right now. Jesus will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Now listen, folks, you've got to believe that. You've got to trust that. You've got you to, gotta, in a sense, uh, profess it, claim it, hang on to it. No matter what's going on in your life right now, hang on to that. Jesus said he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. He's given us the Holy Spirit uh, to, to help us endure, to overcome. That promise that Jesus promised his disciples that he would baptize them with the Holy Spirit not many days from now is the most vital, dynamic, earth-shaking promise that could ever have been given to us. Jesus is not finished just because he's ascended into heaven his physical body's not here any, anymore, but his spiritual body is. And you and I make up the spirit, spiritual body of Jesus Christ. And we're not going to be able to do one thing unless we desire for the Holy Spirit to fill us, for the name of Jesus to be magnified and glorified, because we're going to get all into what we want to do and how we want to do it, when we want to do it. You know, we, we think sometimes we got it all planned out. We dot all our I's and we cross all our T's. But we didn't depend on the Holy Spirit. We didn't depend on Jesus to get the job done. Folks, we, we, we need the Holy Spirit now more than we have ever needed it. I don't think we fully grasp that Jesus is here today in his spiritual body, in us. I think too often we're, we're too individually minded. We just don't come together. We don't die to ourselves so that Christ can live in us. Christ can be the head of the church and bring us all together. Jesus said, if you believe in me, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and the things I did, greater things than these you will do. Hallelujah. Folks, I don't see it happening today. These greater things. I see it here in the book of Acts, and I see it happening some today. Listen up. Jesus does not want us to do anything for him. He wants to do everything through us. Whatever we do for him of our own ability is not much good. The Christian life we live is so much less, I believe, than what God intends. We've misunderstood God's gift of the Holy Spirit. 
the reason it's so important is we can do nothing apart from the Holy Spirit. He's our neighbor. He's our God. He's our strength. He's our comforter. The normal Christian life that Jesus calls us to live, to, 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 to fulfill the Great Commission, to go, Matthew 28, to go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Ghost, teaching them whatsoever uh, he has commanded us to teach. Uh, that life isn't just difficult. <laughs> that life is totally impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. Why? I can't save a soul. I mean, I'd love to pound it into some of your heads. <laughs> Nobody pounded it into my head. <laughs> it took the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit does. There's only one person who ever lived who lived a perfect life, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Praise be his name. Amen. So Jesus tells his disciples in the next verse we're going to read what he wants them to do. He wants them to wait. And he says in verse 8, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's everywhere. You know, as my son Daniel says, that's, that's, that's Kenley, North Carolina. That's Johnston County. That's the state of North Carolina. That's the United States of America. That's the world. That's what he's talking about here. So when it comes time to give money for missions, guess what you need to do? Give money to missions. Unless you want to go to the mission field. You know, we, we need to support missions here. We need to support missions everywhere. The promise of God. Jesus promised the, whole, the, 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 the church that he would fill them with the Holy Spirit, give them the power to overcome in a, in a, in a culture that was not receptive to the, to the message of Jesus Christ, where the authorities were not that receptive. The early church was persecuted uh, many, many times throughout the first 300 years of the history. It's still being persecuted today. Different em emperors of the Roman Empire, persecuted the church, killed people uh, for their faith. But the church didn't fold, folks. The church didn't fold because the Holy Spirit was present. They began to grow. That's so true of the history of Christianity. When the church is persecuted, God's people come together and they realize that they need to depend on the Holy Spirit to get through it, and the church begins to grow. It was true of, of, of communist China during Mao Zedong's or Mao Zedong's, or Dong's, or however you say it. You know, they change it around all the time on me. Uh, I learn it one way, and then they tell me to pronounce it another way. But he had a cultural revolution, and, and, and they were persecuting the Christians, and they come to find out after he dies that the church has grown in China. Estimating today, it's probably one of the largest churches in the world, not because so many Chinese are Christians, but because there are so many Chinese. A small percentage of them means a whole lot of people. It's estimated one or two hundred million Chinese are Christians today. It's happening in Muslim nations. There was a film back in the year 2000 called The Gladiator with Russell Crowe. You might have seen it. Uh, it shows there... It's, it's, a, it's a movie about these gladiators fighting one another in the Colosseum. But in that movie, just prior to Russell Crowe going into the arena to fight, you can barely glimpse it in the background, but there's a Christian family. There are Christians in the arena, and they are wild animals being set loose on them to kill them. And the director of the film, he filmed it. He filmed it. He filmed it. This, this act of, of these animals tearing these Christians' limbs apart, the father and the daughter and the, and, and the children and, and, and the mother, but he didn't include it in the film. He, he put it in the background, kind of. And the reason he did that, he told, was that because it was just too gruesome. It was just too horrifying to see what happened to people just because they believed in Jesus and wanted the world to know the source of peace and the source of joy and the source of love. <clears throat> Why did they kill the early Christians? Why do they want to kill Christians today? It's not for worshiping Jesus. Christians are not persecuted because they worship Jesus, but because they wouldn't worship and acknowledge the other gods of the Roman Empire. And again, that's, that's the time in which we're living. 
Jesus is not going to share the glory with some false god. And, and we've got to make up our minds today because we're being told today we've, we, 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 we can't believe in only one gospel. We can't believe in only one Savior, you know. Uh, we can't believe there was only one person who paid it all and there's only one way to heaven. You know, you've got to believe there are many ways. You can't be uh, so, so stayed, so stuck in, in, in your ways. You've got to be open uh, to, to whatever. Jesus said, there are no other gods before me. The Father said that. The Christian faith is not like some other religion. It's not really a religion in the, in, 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 in the one sense of the word. It, it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's what's wrong with so many of the churches today. We're doing religion. Yeah. We're doing things the way we've always done them, and we're giving a little lip service to Jesus. <laughs> And we're not giving him our all as, as Allison was just singing. Jesus says, I am truly God. There is no God but me. We need to decide today whether we're going to trust him. Jesus tells his disciples he's going to give them the Holy Spirit so when times get tough, They'll be able to handle it. They'll be able to overcome. He says, I'm going to take care of you. Let me tell you, when God gives you a gift, it's exactly what you need. Might not be what you think you need, but it's exactly what you need. You never get something from God that's bad, that fails to equip, that fails to satisfy. What we get from God accomplishes all that we need. James chapter 1, 17 says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Man, I'm so glad, glad that God is stable. <laughs> that God is sure. God is a rock. God is our foundation. He does not change. We're living in a society today where everybody wants everything to change. God does not change because goodness is goodness and truth is truth. It does not change. Every good and every perfect gift, good with God is as good as it gets. Amen? Amen. Nothing can get any better than any gift God gives. On the days of creation, he says he created this and it was good. He created six days and it was good and on the last day it was very good. God's gifts are good and they're perfect. They're completed. This is exactly what we need for that moment. When God gives us a gift, it's the best we can ever have. And one that we can always use. You know, I don't believe we understand the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think we've neglected it. When we come in to worship God, the Bible says we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But are we in the spirit when we come in here? And that, that's a hard thing to understand about the spirit. But I feel if you know you're in the spirit, you, if you're in the spirit, you know you're in the spirit. You sense it. You feel it. God's presence in you. It's the best gift we could have ever been given. How many of you ever, ever, ever got a gift on Christmas that you really didn't want? I, 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 my family didn't have a whole lot of money when I was coming up. And, uh, <laughs> we'd go to my mother's family, the Grimes family, and, and we would exchange gifts, and everybody got one gift. You know, you drew names. And, and uh, I would only get one toy at Christmas, folks. That was it. I'd get one toy. Period. No more. You kids today just don't understand. <laughs> got one toy. And I'd go to the Grimes family Christmas party, and I'd say, oh, God, give me a toy. <laughs> give me a toy. And one of my nice aunts or uncles would give me a nail file kit. <laughs> and, you know, and I'd come home and put it somewhere and forget where it was. That's not the way Jesus is. When he gives us a gift, it's a good gift. It's a perfect gift. And the Holy Spirit is the best gift we could ever have. If we would receive the Holy Spirit today, we wouldn't have to do so much 
shopping at the department store. If we would receive the Holy Spirit today, we, we wouldn't need uh, to need do so much shopping online or to be so worried about the economy or the world or what's going to happen. We can rest assured that the Holy Spirit will guide and lead us. Jesus is telling us today, this is a command, I want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit because times are getting tough. I heard an analogy the other day about when God fills you with the Holy Spirit, what it's like. It's like Superman going to the phone booth. I mean, he comes out totally transformed. You know, and we go to the Holy Spirit. You go to the Holy Spirit, you, you get the Holy Spirit through prayer, through, through studying the Word of God, but through faith, through trusting God that He will do what He told us He would do. If you see people that have got the Holy Spirit, you see people that have been changed. <laughs> they have joy, they have peace, they have contentment, they have love, they are, they're generous, they give. We all have the availability of the Holy Spirit. I've heard it analyzed, though. It's like putting that popcorn pack in the microwave. All those hundreds of kernels in there. And you pop it. And guess what? Most of them pop. But there's some that will not pop. I've tried it before. I've taken them back out and put them back in. A couple more will pop, but there's still some. Some stubborn that are just not going to pop. And I think that's true of, of us with the Holy Spirit. There's some of us that sit here and say, I can do it on my own. You know, I, I, don't, I don't be made a fool of. You know, if I totally surrender my life to Jesus, no telling, he might get me to stand up and speak. He might, he, he might get me to stand up and raise my arms and say, hallelujah, praise Jesus. You know, but, you know he might do something to me, and I, I'll just sit right here. Thank you. I ain't going to pop. Not going to pop. Well, the Bible says don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't quench it. You know, I hope today this is going to be your popping day. I hope it's going to be my popping day. Acts chapter 1, 8. Jesus says, as we just read, there are two you shalls here. You shall receive power and you shall be my witnesses. You shall receive witnessing power. It's like the way I like to say it in, in, in our church experience. You know, I grew up, Ann grew up in, in two Baptist churches, she in Greenville, me in Goldsboro, and uh, we were member uh, people in our church, her church. There was one lady in her church named Miss Henderson. Somewhere she got the Holy Ghost. And she was happy. And she was joyous. And she talked about Jesus all the time. She talked about how much she loved Jesus. She talked about what Jesus was doing in her life. And most of those popcorn kernels in there said, nah. She's just bragging. She, 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 she just wants to be seen. She wants to be heard. I had, had a man in my church, in Madison Avenue Church in, in Goldsboro, North Carolina, and, and somewhere along the way, the man had a business problem, and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he had a business failure in a sense, and somewhere in there he got close to the Holy Spirit, and, and he received the Holy Spirit, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he came back, and he was a totally changed man, full of the joy of the Lord. He wasn't worried about things like he was before it all happened. He had been set free. He was no longer in bondage. And people in church would point their finger behind his back normally and wag their tongues. You know, because they, they didn't understand. And I think that's true of so many churches today. Somebody gets full of the Holy Spirit. You know what's sad? You know what's tragic? Is both of those churches are dying on the vine. They don't have the joy of the Lord. They're not growing in numbers. Because people need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There are too many worldly pursuits distracting us as Christians today. The best way you can be a witness to the world is to know God, to experience God. And the way we experience God, the way that we taste and see that He is good, is we put our faith and our trust in Him. And, and the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit fills us. And I can't explain all that to you. John couldn't explain it, to, to, or Jesus couldn't explain it to Nicodemus except to say it's like the wind. It blows where it wants to. has the effect it wants to. But once you get a taste of Jesus, if you really get a taste of Jesus, nothing else in this world will satisfy you. Nothing. 
And you need to experience the real thing. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, on the day of Pentecost, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <laughs> I love that. I love that. He fills them with the Holy Spirit. And maybe you all know the story that it appeared that there was a mighty rushing wind and appeared that there were cloven tongues of fire on their heads and, 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 and they were just so filled with the Holy Spirit that they busted out of the, the room, the locked room they were in and, and go out in the streets. They were fearful to go out before and now they're bold and they don't care what happens to them. And Jesus says, guess what I'm going to do? The first part of your body I'm going to touch is your tongue. <laughs> James says you can't rule the tongue. No man can rule the tongue, but God can rule the tongue. I think that is one awesome thing. God takes that thing, we don't want to let control of it. We like to use that tongue to, to start fires and, and to cause problems and to gossip. God says, I'm going to take your tongue and, and, and I'm going to use it for, for, for my witness the most untamable part of the body. And I'm go I, 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 you're going to speak in tongues today. You're going to speak in other languages. I'm going to get you to be prophets. I'm going to have you prophesying. I'm going to have you preaching. You people who are too afraid to do anything, you're too worried about what might happen to you, you're going out there. Your tongues are going to be loosened up, and you're going to give all the glory and all the praise and all the worship to Jesus Christ because I'm going to set you free. And he wants to do that to me and to you today. I think of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people were saved. A man who had denied Jesus three days before, Jesus puts him back in the very city where he denied Jesus. Jesus wants us to be his witnesses. You know, you don't have to take a course in witnessing. It's, it's helpful. You don't have to have a thousand Bible verses to witness. John 3.16 will work sufficiently. It's nice to know other Bible verses. It's nice to know as much as you can about the Bible and, and Jesus and God. But what you need more than anything if you want to be a witness is to have an experience. That's what they do in the courtroom, isn't it? They call a witness who saw something or experienced something and say, tell us what's going on. Tell us what you saw. Tell us what happened to you. And that's what's most important. Your and my most important witness is the fact that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit and full of the joy of the Lord. Hmm. I desire that. I, I want people to see the Holy Spirit dwelling in me so that when I walk into uh, my neighborhood or I walk into the, to the grocery store or, 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 or walk in, you know, in, in my job, that people will say there's something different about you. You know, when I, first, when I first came to Kenley Missionary Baptist Church, there was a man who hadn't come to church in a long time, and he came back to church, and he started coming, and he started coming pretty faithfully. We had some, some, some conversations, and I'm not saying this for my glory or my prestige today, but just praise God. Thank you, Jesus. He came up to me one day, and he said, you got it, don't you? And I, I was flabbergasted. <laughs> But you know, he was seeing something in me. It wasn't me. God doesn't need me to do anything for him. God wants to do it through me. And God was doing something through me as I yielded my life and my heart and my mind to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was evident. People saw it. You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. How do you do it? I wish I could just give you a little formula. Oof, you go home, I'll give you a little button you could press. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. You've you got to kind of seek it. Luke chapter 11, verse 9 says, So Jesus says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. I didn't put all of this on the screen, but I'm going to. Read it from my Bible. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? 
If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? So, do you know how you get the Holy Spirit? You ask for him. You trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you ask him to come into your life, and you repent of your sins, and you say, I'm a sinner, and I can't saw, save myself, and there's only one Savior in the world, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he comes into your life, and he sends the Holy Spirit, and then he commands us to walk around being filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, you just ask. You know, I like this passage here. He says, if a, father, if a child asks for bread or a child asks for fish or a child asks, asks for an egg, the father won't give him anything wrong. He'll give him the right thing. Those, those three things are staple foods. They're, they're the basics. Those are the things that we need. They're not luxuries. They're necessities. The Holy Spirit is a necessity. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us when we don't witness as we should. So often it's because we feel like we can't do it well, or we will fail, or, or we will fall short, or we won't have the words to say. Lord, we put witnessing all on us instead of putting it where it belongs in you. Lord, you give us the ability to witness when you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray today that this church would be a witnessing church. I pray that everyone here would receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they would know you and love you and walk with you and have a relationship with you and know the joy of the Lord, know the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding. I pray for everyone here to have that understanding and that knowledge today to experience Jesus, to walk with Jesus to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we quit looking for the things of this world to attract us and to satisfy us and to meet our needs and start looking to Jesus, Father. The only thing we need in this world is Jesus Christ. And you tell us that you'll provide for the other things, Lord. We won't go lacking bread if we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray today that would be the, the desire of everyone here, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. We cannot do this apart from you. But with your Holy Spirit, Lord, we could set this world on fire. We could set this town on fire. We could heal uh, racial conflict. We could, we could heal economic conflict, Lord. We could heal all this gender confusion. Lord, we could, have, we, could, we could heal all this stuff. You can heal it through your power. And, Lord, you, you tell us that you will work through us, that you desire to use us to be a light to this world. Help us to do that, Father. We do it by just surrendering to you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill your people now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll stand and sing our invitation hymn. And God is speaking to your heart today. You can come up and pray at this altar. Come down and talk to me. Talk to somebody in the seat next to you if you know them well. And tell them what God's saying to you today. Don't let Satan rob you of victory. Don't let him not let your popcorn kernel pop. Sin, for he 
has brought me from death to life. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is one gospel where hope is found. The empty tomb still speaks. For death could not keep my Savior down. He lives and I am free. Now on my Savior I fix my eyes. My life is His and His hope is mine. For He has promised I too will rise. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. the church is one we do not walk alone we have his spirit as we press on to lead us safely home and when in glory still I will sing of this old story that rescued me praise to my savior the king of life I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and when in glory still I will sing of this old story that rescued me. Praise to my Savior, the King of light. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise to my Savior, the King of light. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I stand in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, Allison started off by singing and said, Do you really believe? Do you really believe? I encourage you today, believe with every fiber of your being. Uh, it's the most solid rock you'll ever stand on, the rock of Jesus Christ. 